The mark of financial success isn't about getting bigger, better, faster or more. To Paul, success is freedom. Freedom to spend more time with his family or giving back to his community or just more time to go surfing. Paul Glossop, an award-winning property buyer and regular guest on the Smart Property Investment Podcast, has taken the lessons he's learned building a multi-million dollar property portfolio and laid them out in his best-selling book, A Surfer's Guide to Property Investing. For a limited time, get your free copy of Paul's award-winning book and receive a roadmap for building both lifestyle and wealth through property investing. Grab your free copy today at purepropertyinvestment.com. This is a Momentum Media production. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. G'day, how are you going? Phil Tarrant, host of the Smart Property Investment Show. Hope you're well. Hope you're holding on through uh, navigating all these changes but coming out of APRA, which we've been getting into on smartpropertyinvestment.com today. If you're not across this yet, get across it. All this means for investors that you can probably borrow a little bit less money, all up about 5%. So uh, that may change your plans moving forward. But uh, we now know uh, New South Wales, uh, we're coming out of lockdown, which is good. There was pubs were full uh, last couple of days. Everyone gets stuck into it, even though the weather was pretty nasty. A lot of pimped up demand there to go out and have a schooner, much like people who want to buy property. Uh, markets are running, still running uh, pretty hot right now. And um, we're keeping right across it. We're getting people in. We're chatting about it from economists and demographers and those people that operate within property, but also getting real world insights from those property investors who are looking to create wealth through property. One of the greatest, um, you know, there's, I guess, winners and losers as a result of COVID-19. And um, there's going to be things that have changed and will change permanently. And it's made people think differently about stuff as a result of COVID-19. One of them has been, I was always pretty particular about getting people actually in the studio to chat with me on the Smart Property Investment Show. Um, always like the sort of the human interaction, the connectivity. You can have a much better conversation when you can actually see someone. Um, so I was always hesitant to do it over the interweb. Um, However, COVID has made us rethink and accelerate that. And now most of our chats are are over the web, which has meant that we've opened up a lot wider the type of investors we can chat to right across Australia and globally. So that's been a really cool outcome for us from COVID-19, one of a, a handful, which means I can get connected with people. Now, I don't know where this particular investor is located, Darren Nyer, Hopefully, he's some distant land. He's not down the road somewhere because it's just wrecked my <laughs> introduction. But Darren, how are you going? Darren Nyer, yeah, correct? Darren Nyer, yeah. Nyer. Darren Nyer. Nyer. That's it. Darren You've nailed Nyer. It. Where, where, where are you located, Darren? Where are you at? Well, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not far from just down the street. I mean, I'm in the inner west of Sydney. Okay. Uh, in a place called Campsie. Campsie. Yeah. Mm. Campsie's done all right the last few years. It has. It's actually a, a little unit that we bought here uh, last year. And, um, I was kind of new of Campsy, but I, I didn't really look into it too much, you know. Mm. And then when the pandemic hit, it was a great little unit right near the hospital. I thought, you know what? I think some good quality stock near the hospital is going to do all right. Is that uh, Royal Albert Hospital? Is that the hospital? Which one is no, it? This, Prince this one is, no, no, no. This is um, Canterbury Hospital. Canterbury Hospital. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you've been locked up then. You've been one of those sort of LGAs, which is a hot spot, have you? Canterbury? Yeah. Yeah. yeah How's that been for you? Do you go out? Well, so, so we're calling this on the Tuesday after inverted commas Freedom Day on the Monday. Right. Were you in the pubs from 12.01 a.m. Uh, sucking back scoops or did you behave yourself? <laughs> no. Well, as I think a lot of people have experienced, my work has absolutely gone through the roof in terms of just workload and hours and stuff. So during lockdown, I've been as busy as ever. Mm. We're in week 15, I think, of lockdown. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 15 or 16. And um, I haven't had a chance to really leave the house. Okay. What sort of work so, do you do? I'm actually a, um, a TV producer. A TV producer? Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, like shows or television commercials or, yeah. or uh, all of the same? Well, I, I do a lot of like TV shows, you know, the kind yeah. of stuff that you, you watch on TV and a lot of like uh, stuff for the States now and yeah, it's quite an exciting job. Actually. Do you do it for yourself or you work for like some big production house? Uh, so I work for a lot of production companies. Okay. And, you know, the, all the big TV networks and Netflix and Amazon, they'll hire these production companies that I work for to do, to work on projects for them. And what does a television producer do? So like, do you come up with concepts or the creative execution or are you the guy that sits there with your hands out saying, okay, let's take this <laughs> shot. Tell me about this. This is interesting. 
Yeah, no, it's an interesting field and it's really booming. So there's a lot of aspects to TV production, right? So TV producers are very broad. It's a very broad label. So what I do is I manage the technical side of, of our business. So there's a lot of technical infrastructure that goes into making these shows mm. um, and a lot of technology and stuff, and especially with COVID. But then I also, I help manage the teams of creative people. So, you know, we will have 20 or 30 editors and producers and music guys, graphics people, all, all of that kind of stuff. I help manage and schedule and budget and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Okay. How do you go managing creatives? Is it uh, hard work? It can be fun. Some of them have some weird ideas about how to do things. Yeah. But that's the creative collaborative process, right? I think it's actually set me up pretty well for property investment because it's kind of similar, right? You have all these people on your team, all these different people, some of which you've never met before or you're working with for the first time. But, you know, it's a, it's a collaborative process where you've got to be open to people's ideas and different approaches and different ways of working. Yeah, and and absolutely. I like the sort of the connectivity between a professional life with what you choose to do outside of work and, and yours is a, a, a prop being being involved in property. We'll get into that, um, mm. you know, the work that you're doing, no um, creativity. You've been listening to Smart Property Investment Show for many years, I'm told, and uh, which is cool. Um, I guess would you bundle me up as one of those? Is this a creative job? Am I creative by producing stuff like this, or I'm just some annoying guy with a whining voice who drones <laughs> on about property? The question is, what would you do if you were me to make me better doing what I do from your sort of creative insider's view? Yeah, well, it's funny you ask that because I, I was thinking about that. I have been listening to you for a long time. At least a few years. You've been running for a while, quite a while, right? Yeah. So I've forgotten how many years I've been listening to you. But in terms of, to answer your question, I, I would be pushing, and you probably are, I'd be pushing more into the video space. And if you haven't already, you probably have. But I'd be turning that studio into full-on video production kind of studio. And, um, and you know, just coming up with a graphics package, a bit of a look for the show, a visual kind of identity. And, uh, yeah, doing it that way and getting out on, on all the video platforms, like, you know, like the biggest one being YouTube. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and we're working through this right now. You know, we've got the tech. Mm. We installed it just before um, this most recent lockdown. We, our studio is in Sydney for the purpose of videoing uh, the show, which is a bit hard if someone's in the studio and someone's on Zoom and it's a fair yeah. bit of post production stuff on it. But um, did you reckon people are interested enough to watch me and someone else, you, for example, talking mm. about property? You reckon there's enough in there to, you know, it's a big question mark. I've got. We're going to do it, but mm. I want to know from our listeners, and, and please write into us, uh, editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au, whether or not you want to see us talking about property. I don't know how interesting is it. I know I'm a pretty yeah. good looking bloke, but I don't think that's <laughs> only going to, it's only going to go so far. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's a huge market for it. And the reason I say that is that I, probably as of about six months ago, I watch more YouTube than anything else. Yeah. Probably about five or six months ago, I realized my hours of watching YouTube surpassed Netflix. It well surpassed free-to-air TV a long time ago. Mm. And a lot of the shows I watch is exactly what you're looking to set up, you know, where it's often it's often a, a live stream or an almost live stream where you've got a producer switching between the speakers talking. There's different guests that come on during the hour or two hour show, however long, with some decent graphics and a little bit of overlay, you know, some interesting footage that you've got queued up that you can throw over the top of a conversation to help drive the point or illustrate yeah. the point. Okay. Um, That's encouraging. We're going to get into this. Maybe, maybe you can come and help us out with this stuff and uh, give yeah, some I'd love of your to. Cre- Maybe you can be the first guest we have on in the new format. Yeah. Uh, we can have some uh, fun with it because look, it's something I've been wanting to do for, for a while. And the tech now is a lot better than what it used to be. You, know, mm. you had to do all of it post production, but a lot of it now is is sort of dynamic, right? Where you can do yeah. live switching and That's and right. all this sort of stuff. And um, uh, you know, I know some of the biggest podcasts in the world obviously do it um, mm. visually. It gives people a bit of an insight because you know I'm, I'm happy to report none of this is scripted. You know, yeah, <laughs> we've never spoken before. We just got no, straight no. A smack bang into it. And I think being fluid is very much something. You know, it's, it's good for podcasts, mm. also good for property investing. Yeah. Um, so are you a property investor, Darren? You, you're a creative guy working inside television producing, but are you a property investor first and a TV <laughs> producer second or is it the other way around, mate? Yeah, this is an interesting question. So I think for the last 16 years I've been in TV, I've been a TV producer first, but probably over the last few years it's kind of started to switch, which is really interesting. I've had a mental shift where I feel like I, I work now so that I can service debt. Slave to debt. Yeah. And in a good way. I mean that in a good way. So like 
I see my job as allowing me to gain more leverage in the marketplace. And that's not to say that I don't enjoy my job. I really do love my job and I, I'm interested in career progression and, you know, getting better at what I do. But in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, okay, if I can earn a little bit more, that means I can borrow a little bit more, which means I can purchase more property. Mm. There's been a real um, mental psychological shift over the last year or so. And that's good. And you need to go through that journey of reflection and self-discovery by doing it. It's not something you just have an idea and then you, you build out your pathway on that basis. You need to be mm. in the game doing it to actually get greater experience to start framing your perception differently. But, you know, it's not a bad way to look at it. And I guess it gets you out of bed and gives you some understanding, appreciation of the utility of the work that you do, putting aside the enjoyment of the work, but mm. you, you work, you get money in a bank account. What can you do with that money? And if you have more of that money, what more can you do with it? And it's a progression to going somewhere where you want to go. And, and we can have a discussion around that today. Um, yeah. Darren, uh, we've just got to go a quick break. When we come back, um, get the inside story on Darren's property portfolio. Stay with us back in a moment. Are you wondering where to buy an investment property right now? Why not let buyers buyers take the guesswork out of it? We can find you the right place on or off market at the right price. An investment professional from our national network of buyers agents can help you save time, money and stress and deliver you a tailored solution. Talk to us today. Call 1-800-975-051 or visit buyersbuyers.com.au. Welcome back, everyone. Phil Tarrant, uh, host of the Smart Point Investment Show. I'm with Darren Nyer, chatting through his journey, investing in property, but kicking off as professional as a uh, television producer. Mate, what's the backstory with Darren? How did you end up doing that? Did you do a university course or, you know, what? how did you end up doing that sort of work? Yeah, I, I kind of stumbled into it, I guess, like most people do. Our industry is littered with people who just stumbled into it and never left. And I'm one of them. I did do a media arts and production degree. So, you know, at UTS here in Sydney, I did a media arts and production degree and wanted to, you know, everyone wants to direct, right? In my industry, everyone wants to direct and write. And that was my kind of dream. And then I realized there's a lot more to this industry than that. And that's a very surface level kind of dream. And once I started to see all the different roles and skills that are required, I I started to go into post-production in particular. And yeah, just got my first job while I was still at uni, almost didn't finish my degree uh, because I was loving the work so much and learning so much. And so Mm. I just dived straight into work. And um, yeah, it's it's, it's really an industry where you learn on the job, right? So the better the job you can find or the better mentors you can find in my industry, the better because you'll learn 10 times faster than any degree. I guess kind of like property, you, you need to you need to actually be there on the tools, doing stuff day to day and learning. And that's how I kind of started to slowly move up the ranks, so to speak. And your pathway into property, do you come from a family of property investors? Was it something you spoke about over the dinner table, your first generation property investor? Tell me about yeah. that. Well, my, uh, you know, my, my background is Fijian Indian mm. and about what seven generations before that were all from the south of India. And so... My parents, you know, being very traditional Indian, didn't really talk about money a lot. The dinner table conversation was definitely not about money. But as I got into my teens, I started to realize, oh, my my parents and my dad in particular are quite savvy with money. And, uh, you know, I wonder what's going on there. And uh, my dad started to slowly kind of encourage me to get into shares. But, you know, 25 years ago, so I did that and did quite well. And then I started to ask about his property and, and how that all worked. And he took me to a few while I was younger. He, he took me to a few property inspections and, you know, as, as landlords, they'd go and, and inspect the property or check out any damages or repair and stuff. Yeah. And I so, started to just see what that all looked like. So, so where did you grow up? Did you grow up in Sydney? Yeah, I grew up in, yeah. uh, do you know Castle Hill? I know Castle Hill. Yeah. 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 So my parents, um, our family house is out there in, in Cherrybrook, actually. Okay. Oh, Cherrybrook's a nice, nice part of the world. Amazing part of the world. Yeah, yeah, really nice part of the world. So your old man was a property investor. Yeah. Yeah. What, what sort of portfolio did he have at the time when you were a kid? Was it a large one? Was it sort of enough for you? To, was he like a hardcore property investor? Yeah, I wouldn't say hardcore. I think um, he was more just he had some surplus cash and he knew that buying assets was one way to deal with surplus cash, and so he mm. did. And, uh, yeah, but he's a very old school investor, you know. He's He was more interested in the negative to neutrally geared type property that had growth. He wasn't after the cash flow. Mm. But as you know, if you if you hold property in Sydney for 10, 20 years, 
you end up doing quite well. And that's exactly what he did. And um, just accumulated five or six properties and then bought some land out in Bella Vista. Oh, nice. And, uh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> Has he got that or did he sell it? Did he sell the Bella Vista stuff? No, no, he doesn't sell anything. So he oh, wow. they just built on that, actually. Okay. So they've done very well. So, um, mm. yeah, so they live in that in that mansion now in Bella Vista. Oh, okay. Well, Bella Vista, for our listeners, um, uh, northwest Sydney, it's sort of yeah, it's part of actually part of the Blacktown shy by memory because if it's on the left-hand side of Windsor Road. Mm. Uh, but that's where that new train line has gone out, huge growth corridor for uh, yep. Sydney and a lot of people have done well in Bella Vista. What they're planning there in terms of, well, already got the big estate there, the uh, industrial state, which has got a mm-hmm. whole bunch of um, uh, properties in there. But, you know, those new city centres they're building is just mind-blowing. So so was he? Mm. what sort of stuff was he buying as an in- investor? And what I want to get to is are you still buying the same stuff? Was it just like meat yeah. and potato type stuff? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So what in terms of what he was buying, he was he was just buying, I mean, he just stuck to the fundamentals. And mm-hmm. looking back now, I, I really, I'm really impressed with what, what he did. I didn't appreciate it until now, but he was buying properties that families wanted to buy out in the western suburbs and kind of inner western suburbs. So places like Borkham Hills and yeah, Blacktown, Schofields. Well, Borkham Hills has had the biggest growth out of every suburb in Sydney, I think, over this yeah. last period of time. It's gone off the charts. Yeah. But dad was buying back when it was just, a, as you say, a meat and potatoes type suburb, you know. Mm. It didn't have crazy cash flow, but it had decent growth and it just had fundamentals. You know, families wanted to live there. It had good transport links, good schools. And so he just bought in these kinds of areas and then just never sold, made sure he could service the debt and um, just set and forget. And so it's uh, like it's a podcast for your dad. Is he retired or is he still working? Well, he's like every Indian. They want to. They talk their whole lives about retiring. Yeah. But when it comes time, they never retire. They keep working. <laughs> <laughs> so no, he's he's at retirement age, but he. I don't think he'll retire until he absolutely has to. Is the Fijian Indian community in Australia are they big property investors? Like you know, culturally, is that something that you know people get into? And do they talk about property to each other? I'm really, I like the cultural applications and ramifications of uh, into property. It's always an interesting mm. uh, dynamic. What, what's it like in the Fijian Indian community? Well, I think, uh, you know, property investment wasn't really a thing, right? Like if you go to back into Fiji kind of life, yeah, most people don't invest in property there, right? A lot of people are much poorer, their incomes are lower. Mm. So it's, you know, it's just about renting a place that you can barely afford and just getting on with life. Yeah. But in, in Australia, it's, as you know, a little bit different, right? And my dad is is financially educated. He's an, he's an accountant. And so he knows what he's talking about when it comes to numbers. And so, you know, you combine that conservative financial mindset with the numbers of property and they kind of go together pretty well. Um, it's a good store of, of value. So I think that's how he kind of got into it. But I don't think that it's like talked about a lot, you know. My dad has a lot of accountant friends and so they would talk about it. Mm. But inside of the Indian community, I don't think it's that that big a thing. But now that my dad is seen as a leader in that space in our family, I think people have come out of the woodwork and asked him about it. But had he not have gotten into it, I don't think people would have really brought it up. It. Yeah, sort of yeah. environmental situation. Well, you're very fortunate, Darren. So I guess that do that apprenticeship and and the fact yeah. that yeah, you're sort of your old man socialized that pathway for you. So when was the inflection point for you? Tell me about your first property. That, well, let's start at the at the end. Well, where you mm. are right now. Give me some sense. How many properties in your portfolio? So we've got uh, we're going to have four by the. We've got three currently. There's a fourth one that we'll settle on next year. Okay. And do you have a principal place of residence? Is that one of them, or is that in addition yeah. to? Okay. Yeah, that's one. that's one of them. Okay. So so you sort of on your pathway to creating a, a larger portfolio, no doubt. But let's start at the beginning. Mm. Uh, your your first property. When did you secure it? So we bought it in 2015, okay. beginning of 2015. There was a bit of FOMO involved with that one because, you know, the market had gone up a lot and we were like, oh, God, we need to get into something. Mm. So we bought in a, a place called Colleton out in uh, – Colleton. I know, Colleton. In the Western yeah. yeah, you know Colleton. Yeah, near, near the Druid. Yeah. Yeah, I know it Druid. well. Yeah. So we used the buyer's agency and found this house with a granny flat on the back. Okay. Which and, all the rage uh, back then, 2015. Yeah. That's yeah. right. <laughs> What'd you pay? So five. We paid five fifty. Okay. And today, what do you reckon? What's it worth? Well, I think well, the market price is pushing a million, which it's is crazy. insane. Which is absolutely insane. The banks won't give us that. The banks are refinancing at like seven fifty or so, maybe mm. eight hundred. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What's well, still still a good purchase and rent it out? Mm. Um, positively geared, negatively geared? Yeah, it's still positive now. So it's always been about a five and a half, six percent yield. On the refinance, it's you know, the yields dropped a bit. It's been hovering around that five and a half percent, which so, you know. Yeah, it's not bad. So are you generally happy about this first purchase of yours? Yeah, in the beginning I wasn't because mm. the growth was slow and I'm impatient. But you know, now it's amazing. I'm over the moon. It's it's formed the foundation of our portfolio. Yeah. And this is why the first property you buy is always the most important property because you know, there's, only, there's a reason why most Australian property investors, and by most I mean like 80%, only ever get between one and two properties because the first property they buy is the wrong property and it mm. puts shackles on them. It means they can't do much more into the future. Yeah. And we talk a lot about that on this show, but how long before making the plunge were you sort of looking at, thinking about connecting in with property? Did you, that like, you know, how'd you educate yourself to make sure you're making an informed decision? Because you said you used a buyer's agent. So a lot of people just leapfrog and go, I'll just use mm. an expert straight off the bat. Tell me about that. Yeah. Well, I got myself into a lot of analysis paralysis mm. for about three or four years. I was just messing around with seminars and reading and Googling and all that kind of stuff. And probably didn't, it didn't do me any good, really. I had a lot of information and, and I didn't want to act. And then, uh, there was a light bulb moment. I did a lot of like self-development and business development type stuff as well at the same time. Mm. And about three or four years into that, I just kind of realized that I'm just all talk, you know, I'm just all, I tell everyone about all my crazy ideas and how I want to do this and that, but I'm kind of full of it because I don't actually do any of it. Right. And so it took me about four years to really confront that. And I was like, you know what, I've got to actually just do this. And so I did. So I reached out to some mortgage brokers and some banks and, you know, got some actual figures together and then said, you know what, there's going to be no better time. And I, I called a buyer's agent and the scariest thing was paying the fee, you know, because that's when you're in, right? Yeah. And so I paid that initial deposit, whatever it was. And um, yeah, the property started flowing and we eventually bought something. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And that's a big thing, right? You got to make the plunge. Sometimes you got to commit yourself to something, even though you might be un- uneasy about it. And mm. after you make that call and you go, all right, I'm in now, you still sit there and go, oh, what am I going to do? How do you sort of balance those emotions to keep on, on course? Yeah. So yeah, that's a great question. So one thing that I've noticed and that I found for my self-development work was that, you know, that feeling of nervousness that you have or that trepidation or that angst, mm. that hesitation, those feelings that you have, it's all about context, right? So with my first purchase, those feelings were scary, right? They're really scary. Now on my fourth and you know soon to be fifth purchase, those feelings are exciting. Mm. You know what I mean? So it's like you get the butterflies in your stomach, but you can interpret them two ways. And um, that's been a huge shift for me. Yeah, and that comes down to experience, right? You know, you need to understand when you're actually having those emotions and and thoughts. And, and it's those people that can harness that. And by the way, they're good things, right? Um, mm. If you use them the right way, they're really, really bad things if you use them the wrong way. And, and those sort of things can start exacerbating, become quite challenges uh, for people. And investing in properties in all beer and skittle, there's got to be times of uncertainty where, mm. where you just don't know and you might be outside your comfort zone and all this sort of stuff. Like listen to those things mm. and you need to be able to rationalise them, at least control them as effectively as possible. And it sounds like you've now got that skill set, right? It's part of the pathway of, of learning and the discipline of understanding these things and using them for good rather than negative is what the best people do. We're going to have another break, Darren. When we come back, I want to hear about these uh, four other properties back in a moment. Do you want to achieve wealth and passive income through property investing? PK Gupta helps a community of over 10,000 investors achieve passive income by buying top 5% growth and simultaneously positive cash flow property using data. Without wasting months doing research, spending weekends at inspections, or dropping $15,000 on buyer's agents each time. So if you're overwhelmed with information overload, but don't want to drop $15,000 on buyer's agents each time, check out PK's website, consultingbypk.com.au, and learn to build passive income through data. Welcome back, Phil Tarrant, host of the Smart Property Investment Show. I'm with Darren Nyer. First property in 2015. Didn't get a lot of growth at the start, but you're at that period of time when APRA started innovating into mm. property markets, slowed places down, got a lot of investors out of it, so therefore took the heat out of the market, which some said was necessary in Sydney and, and Melbourne, maybe not in the rest of the world. You got some growth. Between the first and the second property, how long? Oh, my God. It was something like five years. Wow. It's a yeah. long time. 
it was way too long. Yeah. Is that, did you find Smart Property Investment Show in that period of time where you went, hang on a second, this is the future? Yeah, I think I did. I think I did. It must have been 2017 or something. Yeah, we've probably been going that long now. Yeah, it's yeah, been a while. you've been going a long time. Yeah. So that's probably. I think that's around when I found you, and um, I wanted to thank you on this podcast because you really did help us through. You know, those times when I was second guessing myself and and wanting to sell. Listening to you just kind of kept me in the right frame of mind, kept me on track, and uh, you know, just maintained my faith in the market and the industry and, and what I was doing. Mm. Oh, look, appreciate the feedback. That's why we do it, Darren, you know, uh, to help people make more informed decisions. So we get a real kick out of hearing those uh, stories where we have actually contributed this, a better outcome for someone. So the second property, tell us about it. Where was it? What was it? Did you buy it yourself? Did you use someone good, bad, indifferent? Yeah. So the second property, uh, oh, it was this one here that we're living in. So it was, uh, we used another buyer's agent. We, we chose a different one and they had a slightly different strategy and so they found us this uh, unit here in Campsie which um quite luckily was one that had bought off the plan two years prior but the it came time to settle and the owners couldn't settle it they had some financing issue so the um, buyer's agent got us in they assigned the contract to us and we got it at a decent price and um yeah and then we moved in here and Campsie when did you buy this place what would this it be was, about 2020, 2019, was it? Yeah, it was, I think it was the end of 2020. Okay. All right. So a reasonably recent purchase. So you've been on the accelerated program now over the last yeah. period of time. Yeah, that's right. I've just been hitting the gas. Okay. And so it works good. You're making money. Salary's going up. Are you sort of living reasonably frugally or you've got a Ferrari parked in the garage? <laughs> yeah, well, I've got some Bitcoin, so the Ferrari's coming. Yeah, but good. um, <laughs> but uh, I live frugally and my wife doesn't, so <laughs> so we've got a nice balance, right? But we live relatively frugally. Like our our savings rate is, I'm impressed with our savings rate. Our rate is about forty five percent of our That's income, nice. which is actually pretty good, right? And part of that is COVID. It's allowed us to save a bit more than normal. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I reckon that there's more money on uh, family balance sheets now than what have there has been in many, many mm. years or generations because of COVID-19. So your third property then, tell me about that. Yeah, so after we bought this one in Campsie, then we bought a commercial property actually. Okay. So that settled earlier this year and we used your friend Scott over at Rethink. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, did he look after you? Yeah, he did actually. He's, yeah. he's actually a really good guy. I was sceptical. Mm. Not about him particularly, just in general, you know, of, of any buyer's agent, I'm sceptical. But when I actually dealt with him, he's, he's actually a really good, genuine guy. And uh, that's why we went ahead with him. So, yeah, his team found us a little commercial slash office unit in Brisbane near the airport. Okay. And uh, the numbers stacked up. It made a lot of sense. And so that was a bit scary. That was our first commercial purchase. Mm. But, um, yeah, the numbers made sense and and they kind of put our mind, mind at ease. So we went ahead with that one. And, yeah, that's doing well as well. It's and, really and well. What sort of structure are you buying in? Personal names or you got trust or what's the deal? Yeah. So at the moment it's all personal names. Okay. But I am actually, I'm actually working on a little project where I'm going to team up with someone and we're going to start buying properties in a trust as well. Okay. That's cool. So a commercial property. So you've got a first investor property, then a principal place residence in a commercial property. A lot of people wait a little bit longer mm. before they get in commercial. Uh, look, Scott's, Scott's good operator, him and his team at Rethink. I record the inside commercial property with him and, and we go right in the commercial property. So if, you, if you're interested, go and check it out. You can probably find it on the feed wherever you listen to this or click around the Smart Property Investment uh, website and you'll be able to track it down. And it's we do that for new to commercial property investors and also those which are, are more experienced. So commercial property, why commercial over resi for that third property? Who sort of went, hey, you should consider this or was that a realisation for yourself? I was just doing the maths and I, I just wanted some more cash flow. I just realised that, you know, we're going to run out of servicing at about property number five. Mm. And so I wanted to buy back some of that servicing with some cash flow sooner. And so that's why that came into it. So that will allow us to just grow for a bit longer, you know. So what did you, people think commercial, when a lot of people view commercial products, they think big office towers that cost hundreds of millions of dollars. What sort of price point did you go in at? Oh, super low. It was like 370 Okay. That's good. And yeah. and you're getting a pretty good yield off that, I would imagine, putting money in your back pocket every single week, month, yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. That's very cool. And, okay, so fourth property, Darren. So fourth property, it's actually an off-the-plan unit in Melbourne in Footscray. 
So Topical. we had a tell me about that. Does it yeah, make you nervous? So, yeah, it makes me very nervous. Um, <laughs> well, I, I did the maths, and it's look, it's a long term play if we do keep it long term. But the the off the plan process has been a little bit stressful. It's something I under underestimated actually. I've never done a proper off the plan purchase before, but it's just been stressful because it was so far out in the future. It was we signed the contract, you know, almost two years prior to it settling. And so I thought I'd give myself enough time, which, which I have, but it's just always in the back of my mind. It's always hanging over me. Oh, I've got to make sure I've got 650K ready to settle, you know. Mm. Um, so I would have really liked to have bought more, more property between now and then. But, you know, with that settlement looming, I kind of feel like I have to play it safe and just hold my cash until we do settle on that one. Yeah, it's a problem. It's like, you know, sort of sort of Damocles sort of hanging over your head. You just mm. don't know. When, when's, the, when's the settlement period on it? Uh, July of 2022. Okay. And when did you when did you exchange on it? Uh, so we exchanged probably a year ago. Okay. All right. So about- um, what sort of, is it a big sort of residential tower? Or is it a smaller development? Tell me about it. Yeah, it's it's big-ish. I yeah. can't remember how many units, but it's, 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 it's big-ish, you know. It's definitely not small. Mm. And were you but sold to on this or you went looking for it? Did you see something or go to somewhere and they went, hey, look, you can buy this today at 650, but guess what? When it settles, yeah. it's going to be worth 850. You're going to yeah. be an instant money making machine. Yeah, yeah multi millionaire. Yeah. So the buyers agents we used, they negotiated this deal with a developer. Mm. So they said they had first dibs on, you know, select units. So you um, call them a buyers agent? Would you call them a property yeah, marketer? I know. Yeah, it's a great. Like it's area. a big, big, big <laughs> difference, right? Yeah, there yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, and look, that's their business model, and I knew that going in. And to be fair, they negotiated quite a few. Like we've got a five-year rental guarantee at five percent from the developer. Yeah. So there's little things like that that they did for us. And you know, looking back, I probably wouldn't have done it. Mm. But you know, we're committed now, and you know, we're well, you know, well you're in right. Like, away. Yeah. Worst case is you can't get the cash at settlement, and you've got to mm. sell it to someone else, and you blow your dough and lose yeah. your deposit just when buying it. And I don't want to beat up your purchase, Darren, because it could be all right. I, I know, I've known a lot of people who have made good money mm. buying off the plan. Yeah. If you if you uh, sign the contract at the right time and then the, the completion happens at the right time and it's mm. been a substantial uplift in property during that period, like you can make some good dough on it. But um, stuff like five-year rental guarantees, like, you know, it all sounds good, but they essentially just factor it into the purchase price, right? Mm. Um, you know, all this sort of stuff. So you really got to dig into it. You can get... I don't want to say lucky. You can get it right, but I've mm. heard of a lot of people getting it wrong. So we're really keen to hear how that stacks up, mate, when you get to that that point where you need to actually hand over the dough. So are you off the grid now or are you, you're still working on some other stuff? Yeah, so I'm working on some other stuff. That property purchase has um, kind of slowed us down a bit, the off the plan, but I'm actually working with a business partner to set up a trust and start to purchase like lots of positive cash flow property. Okay. So one interesting shift I've had is, is I learned a lot from my, my parents and my dad on how to invest, mm. but I've kind of developed my own mindset on, on investing, my own strategy, which kind of deviates from them in that, you know, they're a little bit more old school with the negative to neutral cash flow and, and high growth, mm. which has, you know, done amazingly well for them. But I'm actually more interested in cash flow. I actually realized that if I have cash flow from day one, that's going to make a difference for my life, like immediately, you know. And so that's my focus moving forward is is purchasing ten properties, all positive cash flow in in decent growth areas, and yeah, hopefully retiring in ten years. <laughs> Mate, if you get that strategy right, you're going to do okay. And and a lot of people get obsessed with negative gearing. You got to remember, you got to lose money to get a little bit back when you're negatively gearing. Now it, it could mm. be a good tax outcome for people, depending on how much money you make and what your sort of position is. And you've got to really need a good account to sort that out. But but investing property for the purpose or the strategy of negative gearing is an absolute folly. Uh, mm. Negative gearing is not a strategy. It's a tax outcome uh, through investing in property. So if you get on a pathway of chasing positively geared property in growth areas, i.e. you getting capital uh, value uplift as well, mate, that's a holy grail when it comes to property. You know, mm. I would rather make money and give a little bit away in tax rather than lose a whole bunch of money to get a little bit back in tax. That's um, right. So it's not a bad philosophy. Um, and if you can get both capital growth and cash flow, positive cash flow, for many people, they've built out highly effective property portfolios. And you've got to remember, at a point in time, a property will always become 
well, largely should become positively geared if you don't keep taking money out of it for the purpose mm. of um, refinancing to use it for other things and rent not going up. But a property over time should become positively geared. But if you're going down a pathway of retirement, well, you've yeah. got, to be, got to be getting ahead because – you know, you've got to sell down some stuff sometimes in order to realise those asset values so you can sit back and retire. What's retirement look like for you, Darren? Retirement for me looks like just being able to live wherever I want to live, which mm. maybe not be Australia in 10 years' time, yeah. um, and just being able to um, just socialise more and be able to start my own business and work on other projects and film more stuff of my own and have an unstructured day. I'm yeah. a bit, I'm, I'm a bit, you know what I mean? I'm a bit sick of having these structured days where I've got to go to work and make someone else rich and, uh, you know, and then have a very structured kind of calendar and stuff. I, I'm looking forward to being able to get up at a time that whenever I feel like and go and do whatever I feel like, you know, I mean, that's freedom for me. Yeah. Yeah. And look, you know, it's, it's something a lot of people chase. Uh, uh, the choice is what you want choice to do what you want to do when you want to do it rather than have to do stuff. And for many people, that's what retirement means. So mm. uh, I know most people are looking for that. Darren, I've really enjoyed the chat, mate. Um, as you, it looks like you're about to go down, accelerate this journey, uh, investing in uh, positive gear property. So let's get you back on the show and have a chat. And we do it over the, the video. We'll get that sorted out. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and, and if people want us to start videoing these things, we're happy to do it. We're ready to go. I just want to make sure there's need for it. Like to your point, YouTube's the second biggest search engine in the world, right? It's where a lot of people get their info now. And we put the, uh, the shows up there in audio format. A lot of people listen mm. to it there, but uh, people like to see you sometimes. Uh, do you reckon I'm entertaining enough to watch on the, on the video? Do I got to sort of dress crazily or get a cool yeah, backdrop just- or... I'll just say makeup does wonders, Phil. <laughs> Very good. No, no, I, I think that's, I think you've got you potentially could get a million you know views on on a video on YouTube, and mm. uh, you know I want to see you be the the Joe Rogan of podcasts for the real estate industry. You know, oh, there you go. Well, maybe they, people can send me send me free stuff then. You know, I can yeah, review it, you know, people can Not send the, you properties for free. I can send me properties for free. I'll do a <laughs> as review a, as on a you. Tip, as a tip. <laughs> nice one, Darren. We'll be in touch, mate. Thanks for joining me today. I really enjoyed the discussion. No worries. Thanks, mate. Nice one. That's uh, Darren Nye, a property investor extraordinaire, television producer. We'll get him back on the show and uh, and hear how he gets on. Lots of investor stories. Go and check out smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. You can find us on the on the social media. Just search Smart Property HQ. Track us down there. One favour for me, no doubt Darren's going to do it immediately after this chat is leave us a review on uh, whatever podcast player he listens to. Uh, most of you probably on iTunes. If you do the same for me, that's great. It's just like myself. I get to do the good bit of this job. Uh, that's talk to people. There is a really talented team here of producers that make me sound good and do all the heavy lifting. So they get a real kick out of it. And no doubt Darren would appreciate that. The, the people behind the scenes that make yep. the creativity uh, happen. We'll see you again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property, or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. The mark of financial success isn't about getting bigger, better, faster, or more. To Paul, success is freedom. Freedom to spend more time with his family, or giving back to his community, or just more time to go surfing. Paul Glossop, an award-winning property buyer and regular guest on the Smart Property Investment Podcast, has taken the lessons he's learned building a multi-million dollar property portfolio and laid them out in his best-selling book, A Surfer's Guide to Property Investing. For a limited time, get your free copy of Paul's award-winning book and receive a roadmap for building both lifestyle and wealth through property investing. Grab your free copy today at purepropertyinvestment.com.